page 248 continued, Asiatic, Asiatic mode of production. Saudol repeatedly states that the code segmentary state stands independently of the modes of production on quote page 79 and at the same time associates it with three modes. In his view, under the Cholas, comma, quote, forces and relations of production were significantly different from those of the Alurs, unquote, comma, and yet both of them are given the segmentary label. This is rather confusing because the nature of state is vitally influenced by its economic base. The segmentary state is considered identical with the kinship, page 249, mode of production in the Alur society and with the Asiatic mode of production in India. I have no means to verify whether the segmentary state of the Alurs was identical with the kinship mode of production, particularly when this mode has not been defined by Saudol. But I have sufficient evidence to demonstrate that the Asiatic mode of production cannot generally be applied to what we find in early medieval India. The earlier peasant communal form of production in ancient India according to which agricultural surplus was collected from the peasants directly by the agents of the state was transferred into the feudal mode in which this surplus was collected by a class of landlords that grew between the central state and the mass of the peasantry. References to the Asiatic mode of production occur in the writings of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels at various places. Those who consider this concept viable try to bring the pieces together in order to make the theory coherent and logical. 70. Saudol's quotation from the Grundrisse, G-R-U-N-D-R-I-S-S-E of Marx, page 65, does not make this concept more viable in the context of India. Application to India has come under sharp attack, 71. For changes have been noticed in the forces of production as well as in the relations of production over centuries, 72. In an in-depth study, Brandon O. Leary has thoroughly examined the application of the Asiatic mode of production to the Indian experience and found it untenable, 73. Kathleen Go, G-O-U-G-H apostrophe S, view that no fundamental changes took place in the agrarian mode of production under the Cholas from the 1st century to the 7th century has been quoted with approval by Saudol, page 66. But Guff herself admits that in the initial stage the surplus collected from the peasants amounted to one-sixth of the total produce and in subsequent times it rose to as much as one half of the total produce, EBIT. This presupposes changes in the forces of production which boosted agricultural surplus and suggests changes in production relations in which new mechanisms were developed to collect the agricultural surplus from the peasants in the form of rent or tax and to distribute it among the rulers, warriors, administrators, various types of beneficiaries, priests, merchants, etc. Page 250. Para, in the question, in the quotation form, beg your pardon, para, in the quotation form, the Grundreis, Karl Marx calls the king either the sole proprietor of the land or the higher proprietor of the land. As a symbol of the unity of the original ruling clan or community, the king may have represented higher proprietorship of the land in the early medieval context, but on no account can he be called the sole proprietor. Para. Tamil inscriptions refer to many cell deeds relating to land 
during the late 10th, 11th, 12th and 13th centuries. They show that land was generally sold by the Brahminas organized in communal sabhas for religious purpose and the purchasers were mostly individual non-Brahminas although the number of temples purchasing land was not negligible. We have also many instances of individual Brahminas selling their land. 71. These records leave no doubt that private property in land was well established. Para. Beg your pardon, the previous footnote number is 74. Numerous Chola inscriptions according to which land was granted to the Brahmanas and temples, at least the presence of a well-established private land-holding class in the Chola kingdom. Even the king and the queen had to purchase land for making donations, 75. If the king was the sole or the higher proprietor of land, why had he to purchase land? Subaraya Lu mentions, 76, that the period AD 986 to 1070 witnessed the growth of private property and a well-stratified society. According to him, it would be wrong to think that the king was the owner of the land. We may add that the concept of the royal sovereignty over the land or that of the king representing the higher unity, superseding the other sources of land proprietorship, facilitated land grants. The process of grants strengthened the element of private possession which did not completely destroy the royal rights. The fiction, the fiction of royal rights legitimatized the claims of the assignees who could demand revenues from the peasants. Para. The fact that certain villages or lands were maintained by the Brahmanas organized in sabhas does not make much material difference to the situation. The sabha members did not necessarily belong to the same clan or gotra. Such assemblies were secondary assemblies and not primary keen formations. Their collective strength enabled the Brahmanas to collect dues from the peasants in an organized manner. Page 251 Para The presence of a superior land-owning class between the peasants, many of whom were organized into communal units and the state is well established in the Chola kingdom. Although the peasants were organized communally, many cases show a distinct tendency towards the breakup of these clan groups. <clears throat> 77. More importantly, we have many instances of individual protests on the part of the peasants, not only in Tamil Nadu but also in Karnataka. These protests against the oppression of the landlords mainly occur in the 11th, 12th and 13th centuries. In the case of Karnataka, R. N. Nandi links them with the introduction of several cash-producing cereals and fruits that led to the revival of markets. 78. Instances of peasant protests in the early Middle Ages also appear in other parts of the country. 79. Caste and the state. Whoever wishes to understand the history of socioeconomic formations or of their polities in ancient and early medieval India cannot afford to ignore the factor of caste. Saudol approvingly quotes the view of Barton Stein that, quote, caste was a cultural rather than a political and economic factor in the practical working of Hindu polities, polities unquote, page 53. This view may be formed by those who look only at the outer ritualistic manifestation of the caste system, but in reality the situation was just the reverse. Its cultural and ritualistic dimensions helped the caste to operate effectively as a great economic and political force. The crucial part is it played in organizing the polity and economy of ancient times has been shown by me elsewhere. 
In ancient India, the caste represented production relations and played a vital role in production and distribution. 80. Though it originated in keen conflicts and functional division of labor, warriors and priests gradually distanced themselves socially and ritually from the mass of the community, which was reduced to the position of agriculturists with a sprinkling of artisans, merchants, and farm laborers. The system meant that priests and warriors were withdrawn from the actual work of production. They lived on the surplus produced by the peasants and labor power supplied by slaves, domestics and agricultural laborers who were collectively called Shudras, page 252. The privileged orders of the priests and warriors tried to make the system hereditary, partly taking advantage of the hereditary functions naturally performed in various clans and subclans. The functional division of labor was frozen into the caste system, which served as the organizational outfit of the socio-economic formation in India. In order to make the system stable, certain norms were laid down in the Dharma Shastra or the law books which took full account of the Varna divided society. The four Varnas were kept apart in respect of marriage, inheritance, rate of interest, punishment, etc. A few examples could be quoted. If a Brahmana had four wives from four Varnas, including his own, on his death, the property was to be divided into ten shares. Four shares were to go to the son from the Brahmana wife, three shares to the son from the Kshatriya, two shares to the son from the Vaishya wife, and one share to the son from the Shudra wife. Similarly, a Brahmana was required to pay 2% at as rate of interest, a Kshatriya 3%, a Vaishya 4%, and a Shudra 5%. Crimes committed by the higher Varnas against the lower Varnas were lightly punished while those committed by the lower Varnas against members of the higher Varnas were heavily punished. 81. The role of the Varnas in production and distribution is underlined by the fact that in ancient times Brahmanas and Kshatriyas were generally exempt from taxes. The agriculturists, artisans, and traders were the principal taxpayers. They mostly comprised the Vaishyas. This can be said on the basis of texts and also on the authority of P. V. Kane, 82, who spent the best part of his life in the study of the normative texts called the Dharmashastras. Even those who have worked on non-Brahminical texts such as Richard Fick hold that in the eastern lands the Brahminas and the Kshatriyas were free from taxes, 83. That the existing structure was not far removed from the normative ideas in ancient times is affirmed by the non-legal texts, 84. It would therefore appear that the Varna system was based on unequal distribution of surplus and the entire Varna ideology was developed to perpetuate this system in ancient times, 85. It regulated the marriage system in such a manner that there would be neither dearth of primary producers among the lower Varnas nor spurt in the number of members, page 253, of the upper Varnas who lived on the social surplus. The Vaishyas and the Shudras were comparatively free to marry and multiply themselves, but not the two higher Varnas who had, no, who had to maintain their privileged social identity. 86. Para. In early medieval times, trade and commerce declined, population increased on account of agrarian expansion, and the land, which formed the chief means of production, came to be unequally distributed on a substantial scale. 
Consequently, the Varna system was modified and the class character of society continued in a new form. In certain outlying areas such as South India or Eastern India which were incorporated in the Brahminical society through conquest and land grants and not merely through lineage expansion, the nature of the caste distinctions changed. In the context of numerous land grants to the Brahminas, only the highest and lower Varnas appeared to be important. The Brahminas lived on such grants individually, collectively or as priests of the temples and numerous peasant castes who paid rent and other dues to them came to be labelled as Shudras. 87. Tresses of this system continued to be strong till the beginning of the 20th century. The census of 1901 counted 2,000 castes of Brahminas, mostly territorial, but they were mainly land-holding. Similarly, numerous castes of the Shudras in the country continued to be peasants and to some extent artisans. As such, they paid rent slash taxes or supplied the necessary labor power ostensibly for public purposes, but really in the interest of the possessing castes of the rural areas. The element of caste hierarchy which stressed social superiority and inferiority enabled the high caste landlords to collect taxes and imposts from the low caste peasants. 88. The Varna ideology met the domination of the Brahmana landlords supported by the Kshatriya rulers acceptable to the Shudra peasant caste in early medieval times, 89 para. Caste mobility in early medieval times did not undermine the basic ideology of the Varna system. A large number of aboriginal peoples were being incorporated in the Brahminical caste system and the original non-Sanskritic names of clans and tribes were retained as names of castes in the new Brahminical system, page 254. But the multiplication of castes did not change the ideological framework which promoted the domination of land-owning Kshatriyas or the Brahmanas. It seems that many chiefs of the non-Brahminical tribes were assimilated as Kshatriyas. Perhaps the tribal priests such as the Pahans were also accommodated as Brahminas, but the overwhelming majority of their tribesmen were enrolled as Shudras. Para. One may refer to Godelier's G O D E L I E R apostrophe S view of the caste as an infrastructure. If in the context of structure and superstructure, infrastructure is identified with structure, Godelier's caste would sub subsume forces and relations of production. But in our view, in ancient times, the caste really reflects relations of production. It is true that relations of production also help or hamper the forces of production, but by themselves they do not con constitute the mode of production. We would, however, not go into this question. Origin of the State Saudol seems to have been much impressed by Godelia's view that, quote, in return for invisible realities, the exploited people accept the domination of the exploiting classes, comma, and that the concept of exchange plays a significant part in the origin of the state, unquote, stop. The idea that relations of exchange eventually developed into relations of exploitation may be correct. But it is extremely doubtful whether in stratified societies people automatically believed in the supernatural gifts and services rendered to them by the exploiters. Godelier argues that, quote, the monopoly of the means, bracket, to us imaginary, bracket closed, of reproduction of the universe and of life must have preceded the monopoly of the visible material means of production, unquote, stop, 90. Here, the reproduction of universe has to be distinguished from the reproduction of life. 
the latter may be treated as an important part of the means of production. In order to produce the producer's various forms of marriage and kinship, relations were devised and regulated by the ancient Indian thinkers. There is no ground to believe that originally the exploited people automatically placed trust in the capacity of the dominant individuals or groups to reproduce the universe and life <clears throat> with the result that these groups, page 255, or individuals came to hold the monopoly of the visible material means of production. The literary evidence from ancient India shows that in the first instance the dominant interest groups or individuals came to acquire through force and rituals a large share of the surplus produced by their kinsmen and others who were peasants and eventually extended their control to the visible means of production which produced this surplus. When the dominant groups had succeeded in setting up a taxation system, they deliberately fostered superstitions about they deliberately fostered superstitions about the miraculous and charismatic powers of the gods and the kings to make the common people accept the superior authority of the supreme surplus collector of the supreme surplus collector and consumer and force them to pay more taxes than was warranted by custom. Para. Reproduction of life is a part of the material means of production. Exploiting groups need labor power to perpetuate their dominance. In certain ranked tribal societies, the dominant interest groups regulate marriages in order to control reproduction of labor power. This happened in India in quite a different way. The legal text regulated marriage in such a manner that the laboring and producing masses consisting of the Vaishyas and the Shudras were free to marry and multiply the available labor power. The higher caste did not have that freedom so that their numbers might be limited and their social and economic identity preserved. Next section, Problems of Transition.